<clears throat> Those of you guys have read here before, has anybody <clears throat> ever had a piece that just, you know, you open it up and it stares you in the face and says, try it. And I dare you, try it. Well, I'm going to try it. <laughs> we'll see. <clears throat> you don't get a say in where you're from, whether by destiny or twist of fate, the decision is made for you. Some people get Tahoe, Taos, or Malibu. Others get New York, San Francisco, or Key West. I got the innermost corner of Idaho. Could have been worse, I suppose. My parents grew up in places Google Earth couldn't find with every satellite in orbit. <laughs> places with deserted main streets, rotting skeletons of bandstands, and very little hope. Dad grew up in the mountain ranching community of Meat Creek, <laughs> named for a creek and the small fur-bearing animal that prowled its banks. Some imagination those pioneers had. <laughs> Criminals actually, though not the bad kind, Mean Creek was a hiding place for Mormon polygamists on the run from federal agents. Mother cut her teeth on the ever so slightly more cosmopolitan town of Winder. Then back here, lucky her. Oh, it's a decent enough place, I can see that now. But there was a time when I couldn't wait to get out. Didn't care what I had to do. I didn't care if I starved, and I very nearly did. My determination paid off, though. By age 28, I'd clawed my way into a junior partnership at MHI, while my alter ego, Tommy Connolly, had just cracked the bestseller list, which was why I was celebrating that night at Tacky's. The next thing I remembered was the klaxon on my, obnoxious, uh, on my phone at the obnoxious hour of 9 o'clock on a Saturday morning. Hello, <clears throat> I rasped watching a very nice set of newly familiar glutes repack a back, uh, ripped pair of Calvins. Tad, you sound awful. Are you coming down with something? Hi, Mom, I said as my new friend waved goodbye. I would barely noticed another week had gone by until the call that is. See, I rarely called home. Not that I disliked my family or anything, quite the opposite. It's just the calls from home reminded me of, well, home and the person I used to be. When I call home, I can't get off the phone. If I wait, Mom calls me, and we're done in five minutes. See, Mom's from a time when a long-distance phone call was something to be considered with great care, like the purchase of furniture or a car. Once made, the call follows a model of military efficiency. Say only what you must, prod them to do the same. Hang up as quickly as possible, then pour over every scrap of information like a cryptographer. We were only two minutes in, but already the call felt long, and I was sort of itching to end the thing. But Mom showed none of the usual signs of wrapping up. She delivered the news with a deceptively casual air, right after the weather and speculation on the reproductive status of the family cat. <laughs> Grandma has cancer, she said, followed by words like inoperable and talk of time frames usually reserved for perishable foods or a book on loan from the library. Grandma, my buddy, my cross-country training partner, my cheering section for wrestling, dying. It spread to her liver, Mom continued. She decided not to fight it. What? Why the hell not? She wants to enjoy what time she has, Mom said, to stay in her home and have her family around her. I saw where this was going. Of course I did. A single glance at the clock was enough for that. Mom, now well into her seventh minute, showed none of the usual signs of wrapping up. It won't be long before she'll need help with everything, she said. The family will have to step up. But Cal and Bruce have families of their own, and Shauna will do what she can, but between school and the kids, and so on, with the various excuses for my siblings, and my heterosexual siblings, whose lives were simply too important to interrupt. All of a sudden, it's great that I'm gay. Only took you 12 years. <laughs> the distant hiss of the last <coughs> static brought me up short. Nine minutes and counting. Nine minutes, and there was static. Honest to God, silence on a still open line. Can you come, she whispered. My mind flashed back 10 years. I was loading my pickup when Grandma called. Mom took the message. She wants you to stop by on your way out of town. Great, I thought. I the last minute pep talk. Grandma was waiting on the enclosed porch when I arrived. She ushered me inside for a quick snack. Her house smells of fresh baked bread. My mouth waters as she disappears into the kitchen. She returns with a butter and sugar slathered slice and settles into her recliner while I eat. All set, she asked. Yes, ma'am. You'll call. I nod, surreptitiously checking my watch. We have colleges here, you know. <laughs> Grandma, I know, I know, you always have to be out in the world. Always did, even when you were a little kid, exploring, trying new things. 
If I don't cut this short, I think, I may as well not go today at all. I love you, Grandma, I say, but of course it doesn't work. I love you too, dear. Now have a seat, or are you in too big a hurry for your old Grandma? I sigh and flop down on her giant pink sofa. Ten minutes are all day. I'm here until she's done. I love these chants, even as a kid, but today I answer politely, not in all the right places. Before long, she pushes out of her recliner with a grimace. Age is finally catching up with her, I think, and push the thought away before it can be true. All right, she said, since you're in such an all-fired hurry, I have something for you, though. She hands me a small box wrapped in that shiny chrome and lavender wrapping paper, the stuff people use when no theme really matches the occasion. Go on, open it. My finger slides carefully along the seams. It wouldn't do to appear rushed. As the paper unfolds, a shirtless Adonis and the words Trojan and Pleasure Bank appear. I hope you find what you're looking for, she says. <laughs> Get AIDS. Suddenly I'm flying into her arms. I wanted to come out to her years ago, but Mom and Dad were afraid it would break her heart. How do you know? Grandma actually cackles. You have to get up pretty early in the morning to fool this old girl, she says. <laughs> They're the ribbed kind. <laughs> yeah, it's conspiratorial. Supposed to feel better. I don't have the heart to tell her that the sexual equivalent of a rumble strip. <laughs> I should have trusted her hell. I should have come out to her first. I looked around my La Solis Boulevard apartment at the evidence of the life I built. Tasteful erotic art on the walls, custom kitchen, bang and Olufsen home theater. Recaro furniture, could I come? Of course I could. Would. I found myself wondering two things. First of all, how much would all this fetch at the yard sale? Second, what the hell was I going to do in Idaho? I drove the length and breadth of the United States once more, north along the Atlantic, west through the oppressive heat of the Bible Belt, north again, then west across sun-baked grasslands. It was there that I entered that shaky days of exhaustion and strain, of travel, and the knowledge of how far there is yet to go. On the far side of the high deserts of Colorado and Wyoming, I reached the home stretch, around the Bear Lake, through a mountain pass, and voila, three days. 2,537 miles from civilization, I rolled into my hometown. Nine o'clock, and already the streets are deserted. The city would just now be coming to life. Happy hour at the Marlin, go-go boys at Tackies, or maybe even a show at Shangri-La. Still, the lure of the past was stronger than I'd anticipated. Trials and pains, once all consuming, seemed to barely register. Victories, even the smallest, called like a siren song, and I couldn't resist a bit of exploration. I stopped in front of Hillbilly High, a stifling industrial edifice, once the bane of my existence. Now it was as if the whole thing had literally shrunk. Just a building, a dead or dying reminder of a person I wasn't anymore, the boy who ran away. It was hard to believe I'd ever roamed the halls of this place, harder still to believe I was back. I put the car in gear, drove toward my child at home. Goodbye Sunday brunch, mimosas by the pool, theater, art, Christmas on the beach, goodbye job where my name is preceded by Mr. And loft overlooking the intercoastal. Hello, here, a mere two hour drive from the nearest city and at least 200 miles from the 21st century. Right. Mom greeted me at the door like the prodigal returned, not bad for folks whose sleeping habits follow the sun. It was summer on the ranch, so when I wasn't helping with grandma, I hauled hay and moved sprinkler pipes to chase cattle. I found the ease with which I settled back into rural life troubling, even more so the realization that time had now become my enemy. It always was, of course, but now it had attitude. Grandma's illness and the fact that my parents had somehow gotten old served to remind me of my own mortality. Alone and bored I was, keenly aware of the seconds ticking irretrievably by. To make matters worse, people constantly approached me, ostensibly to chat, but angling hard for even a bit of gossip. They'd always close with, if there's anything we can do. Like they'd really be interested in bedpans or morphine. I reminded myself that soon I'd be gone, then reeled with the guilt of wanting to be. One day at the pharmacy, my flesh tingled at the sound of an all too familiar voice, and there he was, Tony Blakely. His head, anyway, floating between the shelves of lacazids and pro prophylactics like the ghost of drama's past. I thought about saying hi, but our time together was over, except there he was. Here I was, again, which thought spurred me into a base of action. I heard his call in the distance as my car door closed, not as clean as I'd have liked, but mission accomplished. He disappeared back in the store like a phantom. 
Grandma, meanwhile, as she'd done her entire life, took pride in beating her doctor's dire predictions, slipping yes almost by the day but spry. She reveled in visits from friends and family, some not seen in years. Determined to leave this world in an orderly fashion, she took to leaving posted instructions around the house, recording the family history and secret recipes for posterity, and the mere admiration of any object, regardless of size or value, was all it took to turn her into a geriatric game show hostess. Only she noticed my malaise. You should call an old friend, she suggested. Maybe. Tammy asked after you at church. Grandma had served in the LDS primary for five decades, and anyone she taught, regardless of age or disposition, would to her forever have the childhood why attached to their name. Timmy, Johnny, Tammy, Tamara, formerly Jameson, now Blakely, married to the before-mentioned Tony, had long since morphed from childhood innocence into one of the ma nastiest people had ever been my displeasure to know. She enjoyed a brief stint as a pageant queen, a celebrity, however, limited her from a past from most who didn't know her. She's not my friend, Grandma, I said. Well, Anthony certainly is. Said you should drop by for a visit. Suddenly I was 15 all over again. Before I could catch myself, the words, Tony said that, betrayed me. Everybody has a Tony. That one impossibly cool friend, so beautiful it hurts. The shock of thick hair that always did what it wanted. The one the girls fought over, even the guys were in love with him. Grandma smiled. He was with Tammy when she asked. Said you should drop by. Oh my goodness, is it Friday already? You'd better get going. A trap. Now, nah, I said, I'd rather hang out with you. Oh, did I forget to tell you? Linda's coming by to do some quilting tonight. My memory is getting so bad. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with your memory, Grandma. <clears throat> Must be the cancer. <coughs> Liver cancer, Grandma, not lung. <laughs> There, you see? Now go see your friend. The setting sun scorched the tops of pine trees that lined the outskirts of town. I drove past the house twice before I realized it was the right one. Tall weeds surrounded an oasis of civility. A large, well-manicured lawn led to a flower garden around which, cir which circled the house, broken only by an enclosed porch. An intrepid young big-wheel pilot skidded to a sidelong stop as I walked up the drive. Hey there, I said. Is this the Blakeleys? A head popped up from the shadow of the porch. Hello, Tamara, I said. Tad Benson? Tony said you were in town. How you been? We missed you at the last reunion. How is your grandma? I seen her at church, but you know how she is. Wouldn't call the fire department. Her front porch went up in flames. Tony, come out here and look. My participation in the conversation hardly seemed necessary. Besides, at that moment, our young big wheel pilot broke for the open road. I laughed as Tamara took off in hot pursuit, yelling, Ethan Anthony Blakely, you get your butt back here. From the front door, Tony said, Tad Benson back again. I looked, <clears throat> excuse me, he looked exactly the same. Okay, well, not exactly. Better. <laughs> the jawline was stronger, the cheeks were defined. He put on a few towns, but his stomach was still flat and that reckless shock of hair was still stubborn. The body beneath the white shorts and dopey death leopard t-shirt and tube socks solidified into something worthy of being showcased in marble. So you just helping with your grandma or thinking of staying on? He clapped his hand on my shoulder. Dude, say something. Uh, yeah, I said. My chest so tight I could barely breathe. Tony pulled me into the kitchen and sat me at the table. I couldn't believe how good the years had been to him. They certainly hadn't done Tamara any favors. Three kids had undone her beauty queen figure, though motherhood seemed to have mollified her personality deficiencies. Twelve years, Tony breathed, and you look exactly like you did the last time I saw you. I glanced down at his wedding band, wondered if he was really thinking of the last time we were together. Uh, you too are humble. Liar. Only thing missing is a skateboard, I said. Yeah, well, I don't do much boarding anymore. That's too bad. Excuse me? The skateboard, I said. It's too bad you don't ride anymore. Want a pop? He didn't wait for my response. Just got up and grabbed two cokes from the fridge. Actually, he yeah, half-whispered as he sat down again. I do sometimes. Don't tell Tamara, though. She hates it. I had to laugh. Not so bad as secrets go. So what about you, he asked. Tell me your secrets. No secrets here, I said, taking a drink. Undaunted, he drove right in to talk of old times. Hey, remember that old trailer down the hollow? Dude, best porn stash ever. Ever, I asked. You have at least heard of the internet, right? 
<laughs> and then time we snuck the pant house up to scout camp, Tony continued, Mixel was so pissed, he made us watch while we turned it. Didn't stop me from looking at every creepy page. Tragic. Remember that centerfold? I mean, damn. Not really, no. You gotta remember. What is he kidding me with this shit? Um, it was never the centerfold I was looking at. Tony smiled. Me either, he said. And then his foot was in my crotch. <laughs> Are you out of your fucking mind? Tamara stepped in from the yard. Language, guys. Uh, sorry, I said to Tamara. A young girl ran through the kitchen calling, Daddy, can I watch TV? He began needing me with his foot. Sure, sweetie. Jeez, Tom, I hissed your kid. Tony laughed. Uncle Taddy's funny, huh, sweet pea? Uh-huh, she said. I'm off to book club, Tamara announced, coming back through the kitchen. The kids have a play date at the Peterson's at 8. Connie said you can send them over anytime. The boys are outside. Miley's watching TV, so be sure you drop them off before you go anywhere. Just drop them on the way, will you, huh? Tony, I'm late. Tony responded with a face, a lopsided grin. We've been getting him out of trouble ever since we were kids. And of course, Tamara milled it, just like I used to. Please, I'll get Tommy here to sign his book for you, he coaxed, his foot just churning away. Oh, I'm sorry, she said. Do I, do you go by Tom, Tommy now? It's okay, I imagine. Managed. Just a pen name. Well, whatever you like to be called, I just love it. I hope you remember us when you're rich and famous, Tony said. What do you think, what makes you think I'm not, I asked, my poker face, stretching that last royalty check to the limit. Everyone goes to their share of socially awkward moments in life of that, I'm sure, but I dare say that signing my pen name to a trashy romance novel for an old acquaintance while getting a foot job under the table from her husband in the semi-attentive presence of their kid, not to mention the doing so, the doing of it in a calm and affable manner has earned me a free ride in the next life, regardless of what else happens in this one. <laughs> Even so, the moment she left, I brushed his foot aside and rose awkwardly to leave. Kept track of you over the years, Tony said. What do you think about that, Internet? Spell a guy's name just a little differently in a web search. Well, reminded me of some of the stuff you and me and Gabe got into. I froze and he grinned. I'm not ashamed, I snapped. I got out. I did what I had to do. I made it. And if you think for one second, you were right, he interrupted. What? Right, right about what? About a lot of things. I forced myself to calm. I had gotten out. I could do so again. His was a life sentence. Look, I said, I just want to make sure the lines don't get crossed here. And we crossed before, he said. We were, what, 16? You're married. Tony uncoiled from his chair, wrapped his hand around the back of my neck. 17. And I was beginning to think you'd forgotten. I remember everything. So, if we cross that line, what if I were to touch you here? His hand headed to south as his lips brushed mine. Jesus, I whispered. Tell me you don't want to. So what if I do? What about your kids? Your wife? They mean anything to you? They mean everything to me. So where does that leave us? You mean everything too? You can't have it both ways, Tom. So that's it. One mistake and I'm done. Mistake? Yeah, I mean, no. I'm, dude, she's not you, okay? I'm dying here. When I saw you were back, I mean, we were good together, right? I know I've got baggage. I just thought maybe if we were careful. His voice trailed off. Everything around me melted away. The crappy J.C. Penny kitchen, the clapboard house, the whole hideous little town. But I slid so far down the moral ladder that wedding vows held no meaning. On a cold November day, the week before Thanksgiving, Grandma died. That the sun still rose seemed incredibly unjust. Tony stayed close during the service at the cemetery through the Relief Society dinner. We were cleaning up when he pulled me close, nuzzling my ear. I fell into his embrace. It felt right, like I'd finally made it home. I should go, he whispered. You gonna be okay? I'll be fine, I said. Vegas next week? I smiled. Like Grandma said, we all have baggage. The trick is getting it to match. See you then, I said. <laughs>